training of P and community coach. Kluka has earned two doctoral degrees, one in more learning from Texas Women's University in Texas, USA, and the other in sports management from the university in South Africa. She has a distinguished career in education for 45 years. After several years at the high school level, she invested substantial years at Grambling State University and Barry University, where she retired as Dean of the School of Human Performance and Leisure Science. Kluka now provides consultation, education, training, and research in sport leadership, curriculum design, social change, and development, strategic planning, and publication. She is currently Vice President of the International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education, ICSSP, and a member of COSMA Board of Directors. She has served as Charter Member of USA Volleyball Sports Medicine and Performance Commission, Vice President of USA Volleyball, President of the National Association for Girls and Women in Sport, as well as International Association of Physical Education, Sport for Girls and Women, and as Deputy Delegate to the United States Olympic Committee. Kluka has been presented with the prestigious ICSSPE Philip Noel Baker Research Award, Leader in Volleyball Award, and has been inducted in the, into the American Volleyball Coaches of Fame, National Association of Sport and Physical Education, NASPE, Now Shape, Hall of Fame, Commission of Sport Management Accreditation, Hall of Fame, and in the Master Professor category, and Illinois State University College of Applied Science and Technology, Hall of Fame. She has been selected as a distinguished alumnus of Texas Women's University. Her research interests include women in sport and governance, as well as visual skills in sport. She has published several texts, juried on more than 123 articles, and presented professional research papers in all the five continents. Indeed, ma'am, it's a very proud moment for us where you're here and you've blessed us with your valuable presence. And I'm sure your insight and experience will pave path for promoting physical education and community coaching in the country. Madam, please. I uh, thank you all very, very much for this marvelous opportunity. Uh, all of the things that you were so gracious to talk about uh, in terms of what I've been a for 45 years, can you imagine? That has set me up for this marvelous historical groundbreaking opportunity. I uh, cannot tell you, you know, I think that everybody in the world gets goosebumps, you know, on the arms when you're excited. That is what I am this morning. So I'll try to keep my goosebumps in place, but at the same time, uh, I think we'll have some, uh, hopefully some fun while we're learning because learning is much more fun than having a headache, much more fun. Uh, I wanna thank um, particularly my uh, dear uh, colleague and more dear friend, uh, Rosa. Uh, without Rosa, I would not uh, have this opportunity as well. And, you know, this is the exciting part about being um, with an international group. I don't have an international group. I have an international family. And so when something happens in a personal way to people, uh, I suffer or I am enjoy with those people as well. Because at the end of our lives, the question is not how much did you know, but how many lives did you touch and how many lives and how many people touched your life? Um, that's the most important thing. And uh, I hope that I can convey that uh, through this uh, presentation that uh, I've been blessed to be able to produce. So let's get after it. 
Whoops. Whoops, wait, wait, wait. Okay, is that good? All right. <laughs> Uh, I first, uh, you know, Rosa yesterday uh, was, uh, had, had a wonderful, oh goodness, had a wonderful presentation, uh, and she showed a little bit about Venezuela. So, Rosa, I'm going to uh, steal a moment and uh, let people know what uh, Louisiana looks like. Uh, so, we have a lot of things that are called bayous. All right, and so uh, the picture in the top left of your screen and the middle one are these funny things called swamps or bayous. Uh, they have alligators, not crocodiles, uh, beautiful birds, and uh, some uh, very strange uh, 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 snakes that have been brought in from uh, South America. So they don't really belong there, but they've gotten there and they love it because it's so hot and humid. So if you look also in the picture of the United States, uh, the state that is in uh, a circle is the state of Louisiana. I live very close to the bottom. And so we call this South Louisiana. And uh, right now, uh, a couple of us are concerned because there is a hurricane, or uh, actually it's a tropical storm that's coming up from Mexico through the Gulf. So by Sunday, uh, we could have some very serious weather. So it's a good thing I know how to swim. And in the meantime, I want to be able to share with you uh, something that's been going on for probably mm, 20 years. And someone that was in an NGO, non-governmental organization, was kind enough to start this. And as life has gone on, I have the most recent documentation of it uh, as of 2018. So these are not uh, real time, but they'll be close enough. So the question was, what happens when you take the world and you condense it into 100 people? in a village. So it would look a lot like this. There would be 50 people who are male and 50 people who are female. So I want to share with you an American Indian or one of our indigenous people, what some of their thoughts are on this area. 50-50, that means in their culture, that women hold up half the world. I want you to seriously think about that. Women hold up half the world. That means that the other half has been held up by men. And I know that the men sometimes get tired of holding up their half of the world. So it's time for them to relax a little bit and let the women help out. In terms of skin color, 70 non-white and 30 white. Regions, the largest region that has the most people is the area of Asia, which India belongs to. So in that village of 100, there are 61 Asians. 13 Africans, 12 Europeans, eight from North America, five from South America and the Caribbean. And Rosa, I'm sorry that uh, I was not able to get more specific or, or more general rather in uh, Latin America, but uh, this was designated by South and North America. And then one from Oceania. So Janice, if you're listening, uh, that, uh, that must be you. In terms of religions, 33 of those 100 are Christians, 21 are Muslims, 13 Hindus, six Buddhists, one Sikh, one Jewish. And on top of that, 11 practice other religions, 11 are not religious, meaning that they're agnostic, which means that they 
would think that there's something larger than themselves, but they really don't have a particular religious uh, belief. And three, believe that we are here on earth ourselves and uh, when we come in we're good when we go out we're good and that's all there is to their piece of their life the way they believe it in terms of languages oh my goodness chinese 17 out of those 100 would speak chinese nine english eight hindi six russian six spanish four Arabic, and the other half of the group would speak other languages. So the interesting part to me about this one is uh, to sort of ask ourselves, why did we come up with English as sort of the official language for the world? Well, it had to do with business. How was the business of the world going to be conducted? And at that time when it was decided, English won out. Um, the British uh, English uh, would think that I have a terrible form of the Queen's English. However, uh, we too were a colony at one time. Uh, but uh, some of us had the good sense, you know, to uh, uh, move on. So um, we use English primarily for that. But as we go into the future, uh, Chinese um, may uh, take the, the new place. Uh, at one time, if we looked about a quarter of a century earlier, Russian and Spanish may have been uh, the big languages with many more speak, people speaking it. But time goes on, the world goes on, and uh, so these things are capable of changing. In terms of sexuality, there would be 88 heterosexuals, 11 homosexuals, and one bisexual, transgender, or uh, there could be other designations, but there would only be a small percentage of them. In terms of health and mortality, half of the village would be malnourished. One would have HIV, one would be near death, and two would be near birth. Now, if you think about that piece, near birth, that means we're going to have more people coming into the world than passing out of the world that will make a huge difference in terms of what we do and how we do it. In terms of living standards, 43 live without basic sanitation. That's almost half of the village. 20 have no clean water that is safe to drink. 80 live in substandard housing. Oh, and by the way, let me come back to that, the safe water to drink. When we go internationally, there are times where we will need to drink water from bottles that are already pre-sterilized uh, or pre-done uh, in some way so that uh, we would have safe water for all of us to drink. Uh, I can tell you that when my friends from the Philippines come here, uh, we have to be very careful of what they drink because the bacteria that they have in their bodies is different than the bacteria that we have in our bodies here in this country, partially because of the water. So um, anytime that you're traveling international, be aware that uh, water will have a different content when it comes from the taps rather than when it comes from the bottles that are prepared. 80 of them, that means uh, four-fifths, 80% of the 100 people will live in substandard housing. 68 breathe clean air. However, because of the COVID virus, and the fact that people have to stay home, there are areas of the world that temporarily have got clean air. They can actually see how beautiful the sky looks when it's blue, rather than how beautiful the sky looks when it's gray. 
and 32 breathe polluted air. So that piece, one third of the, the village uh, would have uh, respiratory conditions. And then how does that impact what it is that we're about in terms of, in terms of physical activity, physical education and sport? In education and technology, 12 would be unable to read. All right, so that's 1.2% of the world that cannot read. 12% of the world, I'm sorry, 12%. Uh, 12 own a computer, own a computer. Eight have internet connections and one would be college educated. 48 cannot speak or act according to their faith and their conscience because they may fear harassment, imprisonment, torture, or death. 52 can. So slightly more than half of the world's population cannot speak or act accordingly. 20 live in fear of death by bombardment, armed attack, landmines, or of rape or kidnapping by armed groups. And we can think of, of uh, situations like that uh, all around the world. Uh, the biggest piece uh, difficulty that I have personally is the notion of uh, rape and kidnapping. Uh, this is a terribly, terribly traumatic event that happens to many people, uh, 20 people out of that 100. So one fifth of our world is subject to that. And it's not only girls or women, it also includes boys or men. So this is not a, a situation that we will all blindly close our eyes to because there are many situations that sport, physical activity, and physical education can be of assistance in those. So uh, I have to tell you that I'm uh, biased about those kinds of things. And uh, I will share with all of you that until you have had that type of experience and you still are alive as a result, it takes years to get over that. And uh, sometimes some people never get over it. Okay, so the world's wealth, six people, oh goodness, this is where I get a little embarrassed. Six people own 59% of the world's wealth. And at this moment, all of them reside in the USA. That does not mean that we are all rich. And I am one of those other people who are not in charge of all the world's wealth. 74 people own 39% of that world's wealth. 20 share the remaining 2%. 21 people live on a dollar 25 US dollars per day or less. That's remarkable. And some of those, interestingly enough, do reside in the USA. The village spends 1.24 trillion US dollars on military expenditures. Now think about that. How many people could be assisted in coming out of poverty in the world if that type of money was used for human benefit rather than human defense? $100 billion US has been spent on development aid. So, if you keep your food in a refrigerator, if you keep your clothes in a closet, if you have a bed to sleep in, and a roof over your head, you are richer than 75% of the entire world's population, and Let's appreciate what we have, and we will do our best for a better world. All of that said, I want to introduce you to the International Council of Sports Science and Physical Education, who 
collectively wants to do really wonderful things for uh, the world. So let's ask first, uh, why is it important for India to be part of the global community of sports science and physical education? And <clears throat> let me say a little bit about sports science. Sports science are, uh, uh, encompasses all of the kinds of disciplines in the world that have some way to touch sport. So biomechanics, exercise physiology, um, motor behavior, motor learning, motor control, motor development, uh, nutrition, sport nutrition, sports medicine, uh, sport training in terms of strength and conditioning, and we can go on and on, including, I want to add, sport management, because it is part of the management sciences. That's the sports science piece. Generally speaking, how do we uh, combine that with what we're doing as a world? Well, we need scientists, especially sports scientists, to lead the way to provide us with evidence-based information and evidence-based practice. Yesterday, Rosa did a marvelous job on speaking about uh, physical education. And I want you to always be thinking about physical education and sports science as having quality. Right? Because I can say to the world, we have 15,000 schools. But if I say they are 15,000 schools and they have someone who is designated as the physical education teacher, that does not mean that we have quality physical education. Or in the case of sports science, do we have qualified coaches and uh, professors and teachers in order to translate what is coming from research to be able to place that so that physical education teachers can use the information uh, to make the world a better place. So this is kind of uh, what uh, I found. Uh, this is one of my dear friends, uh, Celia Breckenridge. Uh, Celia ha uh, unfortunately has passed away. And she uh, did a lot of wonderful work in the, um, throughout her career on sport, children's rights, and violence protection. She also did a lot of work earlier in her career with um, people who are uh, um, in um, uh, ho um, homosexual uh, and heterosexual, uh, things by sexual identity and sexual uh, predetermination. Uh, so Celia, I take my hat off to you and uh, I want to honor you in some way uh, with all of the good things that you've been doing. Uh, if you want to see a really good example, take a look at the resource that Celia has done. And if uh, you would rather Google her, perhaps, uh, that would give you some other ideas about how do we make this world work better for everyone in all of the conditions. You'll notice that <clears throat> Uh, it's important for those of us in physical education, physical activity, and uh, coaching, uh, as well as in sports science, to create environments for children, but more importantly, for all people that is going to be protected and sporting uh, at the same time. And that is fully possible, but there has to be a commitment to that. And unfortunately, <clears throat> that also includes if children or people are coming to a facility, then we've got to ensure that how they get there will also be a safe environment. You know, sometimes things happen on trains or on buses, or even when you're walking, uh, that some very strange things happen in terms of people's safety on those. And so we have to think about going to and coming from places in order to participate safely and in order for those children to be protected. 
All right, so here we come to uh, the specifics of uh, who are we as XP? Well, we have three basic areas that we're concerned with. And we want to take uh, the science piece and we may create some of that science information through research or grants or some other types of activities, usually looking at the larger piece, which would be at the national or international level. We want to also become kind of translators for that research information so that um, physical activity and sports science and physical education can all have um, more information that is science based because nothing is worse than to go only on opinion or this worked for me i'm sure it will work for you and because it worked in australia does not mean that it's going to work in india or vice versa we're also involved a great deal with policy. And so we work very hard with uh, other international leadership in the world, uh, including the United Nations, UNESCO, uh, UNICEF at times, um, those types of things, International Olympic Committee, uh, World Health Organization, to promote policies for not only an active lifestyle for each person so that they own it, but we also look to see how is the human central to policy making uh, and good governance that has to do with physical activity, sport, and physical education. And then, of course, we're uh, always dedicated to education. And where we go with that is the secret, I believe, to a, a better life is education. That has to do with formal education, that has to do with um, improving the quality of life be by becoming more educated in a variety of areas, particularly in our case, variety for healthy living, uh, for a quality life, not that it can extend our lives, but that it can improve the quality of our lives for the time that we're here on earth. And all through physical activity and sport and physical education, we constantly need to learn about our bodies and how the environment interacts with us. And that's uh, for me as a person who's years old, and it also means the opportunity for us to uh, help one another gain insight. So look at all the marvelous co collaborations and partnerships that ICSPE has. We've got uh, the sport movement, which also I forgot to mention uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency. We work quite a bit with them on policies and decision making as to how to be uh, equitable and uh, have integrity in what they're doing and uh, being honest with the world about uh, the situations. We work with uh, practitioners or uh, sometimes I like to call them uh, field-based professionals, uh, because if we're talking about physical education teachers, they for sure are field-based professionals because they have had to go through formalized education and earn some type of a certificate in order to be a certified teacher in many parts of the world. So um, a field-based professional is, um, uh, I take my hat off to them because uh, uh, for quite some time, I happen to be right there with you. Uh, we also deal with scientists and the scientists come from all sorts of areas uh, in the world. Uh, one of the things that I didn't mention before for science, uh, sport science would be the area of sport law. And that is one that is just up and coming and it's extremely difficult to have international sport law because of all of the 
other things that are so difficult. But it's coming uh, because many of the people who now are going to the international level are looking to see how can we resolve these things uh, perhaps outside the IOC. And one of the most recent situations uh, was the Castor Semania situation with uh, International uh, Athletics Federation. She went from to the Federation, she went to the IOC, and then she had to go to the courts of Switzerland in order to get something resolved. Uh, perhaps in the future we'll see that a little differently. Uh, the sport organizations, each nation, if they belong to the Olympic movement, has sport-specific organizations dedicated to uh, the, uh, the sport discipline, whatever it is. We also have governments, and uh, just as Sports Authority of India uh, is around, uh, there are other parts of the world that have ministries in sport and youth or some combination. I do have to let you know that uh, the United States is rather unique in that. Uh, we have no official national government. Uh, so this is um, kind of foreign to those who are in uh, the USA, uh, but uh, we certainly can learn. And uh, the rest of the world also uh, needs to be able to uh, learn uh, that uh, governmental involvement isn't always possible or sometimes maybe not even necessary. It depends on how your government and your people see things. And then of course the corporate sector. This is a huge piece that is I think uh, extremely important. Um, how do we get private business to be supportive of what we do and what we believe in, in terms of science, education, and policy, in order for them to come to us, that would be the ultimate, come to us asking for our help when, they're, when they want to start programs, projects, and initiatives. Uh, that's a little bit of a dream, but at the same time, uh, it is possible. Maybe not in my lifetime, but it is possible. Well, HBO also has a number of wonderful uh, things that are going on. And, you know, it's like everything else. Uh, lots of groups have things going on in terms of services and products. But until we all begin to incorporate those into our daily professional lives, we may miss some of these things that are absolutely fabulous. Just as an example, Rosa spoke yesterday brilliantly about Minex and Iximus. Uh, Minex, again, is the uh, senior officials and ministers of sport throughout the world. And they've already had uh, five, or, no, they've already had six conferences together. And uh, the Kazan Action Plan is something that came from that. That is, the Kazan Action Plan can actually be beneficial to all of you in India. Uh, but you have to be able to know about it. You have to be able to then take uh, what you can and put it into an Indian context. Uh, we have policy papers. We have evidence-based uh, advice. Uh, and the people in the Ixby family, if you will, of which all of you can be a part through your organization. You have the opportunity to um, provide advice as well as an expert. And uh, in our country, uh, how do you define an expert? Uh, if you, someone knows you more than 50 miles or 100 kilometers away from your place of residence or your, your school or your uh, government uh, offices, then you are an expert. But under 50 miles, they may argue with you. And of course, that's a joke. <laughs> um, the policy, so we drive policy in a variety of ways. Uh, we have a number of uh, uh, things that we've partnered with, with Nike called Design to Move. Um, we also have a number of uh, 
different kinds of conferences that we have jointly put together with um, the African Union, as an example. Uh, those uh, have been very, very fr fruitful after the Kazan Action Plan. And so we attempt to help drive policy uh, for a variety of uh, organizations that are trying to look for worldwide uh, um, assistance and collaboration. And then we are truly a, a pretty good broker on research, uh, studies and cutting edge science. Um, one of the things that uh, we just uh, published uh, is a, a thing called Managing Sport Across Borders. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, Rosa and I were two of the four editors uh, for that. So uh, Rosa, I thank you again for all of your contributions. Uh, but there, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to look at sport management through uh, an international eyes that have, has not been done before. Uh, so um, uh, all of you who are interested in uh, managing sport across borders, you might want to really seriously take a look at that. And uh, in the past, we've had some wonderful journals uh, uh, and um, uh, the Bulletin, which is a, uh, a really well done magazine that uh, has science as its base. And we'll talk about research that's being done or not done and talk about issues and so forth at the international level. <clears throat> and by the way, it really would be nice to in the future as we go on to have India have a very significant contribution to all of these services and products because you are a part of the 21st century world in sport, physical activity, physical education. So here are some current projects that we've, uh, we're about. We're designing uh, sport programs against extremism and radicalism. All over the world, that is relatively uh, challenging. And I won't say problematic uh, because for me, problems, uh, we have no way to solve them, but challenges, we will rise up to those challenges. Uh, if you look at um, today's activities in the United States of America, I can tell you that, um, uh, yeah, we're on fire, uh, but uh, I've lived long enough to see that we've had been on fire for a variety of reasons in our past, over 200 years. That said, um, we uh, very much, self-included, uh, are more than happy uh, to be involved with programs that are against extremism and radicalism. And, and there's a, a, a project that, uh, again, Rosa and I are involved with, but uh, Rosa always kindly uh, takes the elderly with her and uh, gives me opportunities. And so I'm very appreciative of that. Um, <clears throat> we're doing an analysis of sport programs uh, for women in Asia and uh, India is prominently placed, and so is Dr. Ucha. Uh, promotion of context, uh, concepts for active cities. This is a huge piece because there are certain ways when you go to reconstruct cities that there can be opportunities to promote active living. And uh, I want to give a, a wonderful shout out to one of our uh, colleagues on the XV board, uh, uh, executive board, Pedro from um, Portugal. Uh, Pedro uh, is an economist and he is helping many times in many places in Portugal how to develop um, active cities and active uh, people in those cities. So uh, it's really fun when you can know people who are actually doing work in these areas. Uh, professionalization of coach education. Uh, a little bit later, we'll invest some time uh, talking about what does it mean to be a community coach? Because I know that's one of the things that uh, you all are interested in. Uh, design of educational material for sport inclusive opportunities. 
right? And so the question becomes, not only are we attempting to live out a sport for all, but we need to make sure that we're including sport for all. So we've got uh, an international organization specifically, IFAPA, which is uh, the adapted sports. And um, the, we spend and invest a lot of time working collaboratively. And you saw that yesterday in Rosa's presentation, uh, all of the research that those four organizations are, have been conducting um, makes a huge difference uh, in terms of what they're able to accomplish because working collaboratively with four international organizations on the issue of quality physical education makes a big difference. All right, so what are we trying to do? Uh, we're trying uh, to conduct some systematic literature reviews. So as an example, uh, let's say that we don't really know too much about the topic of physical activity and physical education and human movement, physical literacy for <clears throat> conducting uh, for um, uh, children and between the ages of zero to five or zero to six. We have systematic literature reviews that uh, our colleagues in the office does in order to be able to let uh, other organizations know what is the story that goes with this. Uh, we're having some inclusive coaching recommendations that's uh, being conducted by a Delphi study. We also are, are developing policy guidelines that help WADA, as an example, or other international sport federations to figure out how to promote whistleblowing as it relates to doping. And uh, whistleblowing is a, a very sensitive matter, particularly if you are in the position of having a job and yet you know that something's not going well do you say something or do you not? And if you say something, what will that cost you, if anything? So there need to be policy guidelines. So we're working on that. And uh, to pre prevent um, young people, or at least to minimize young people from radicalization and extremism, we're also trying to put together a piece that will create some good practices that people who are on the ground in the midst of things can be doing it. And one of the more important things that we do, in my opinion, is we also help people with monitoring and evaluating their projects. So just as an example, for this historical event that we're having, monitoring and evaluating this to see, did this initiative make any positive impact at all? How will we know that? How can we monitor that? And how can we evaluate it? And then use that evaluation uh, to make things better. All right, so these are the three membership categories that we have uh, for IPSPE. Uh, one is the uh, scientific and educational organizations uh, of which generally colleges, universities, uh, and other uh, research institutions belong to. Non-governmental sport organizations, uh, those are NGOs. And then uh, the government, uh, which it, it easily includes the ministries. So the Sports Authority of India, as an example, would be uh, a governmental uh, sport uh, uh, entity. And uh, what they do, so the scientific group, which is generally speaking colleges and universities and research institutions, well, they provide a safe space. They develop sport and physical education policies, and they ensure that there is good governance to make all of this work. The NGOs, again, they develop sport, they educate values through sport, and it does depend a little bit on the emphasis of where those values through sport will be directed and with the age group 
So they're uh, looking at age appropriate kinds of ways to behave in order to ex express the values through sport. And the governmental, which is responsible for sport and physical education in the country. Uh, they have to help in educating uh, the new generation of whoever is going to be coming as leaders in sport. And that always is not always people who are coming with an education background. Those could, uh, could easily be people who are uh, driving trucks, who then take on the responsibility, perhaps as a volunteer, to help educate the new generation that is coming behind them. So here's what uh, ICSP has. We kind of have a key. And uh, we believe that we're one of the international leaders of, with a key uh, to collect and provide evidence on physical activity, physical education, and sports sciences. We organize training, but I always like to say, um, this is how I kind of see my, my life, uh, rats are trained, people are educated. And so I always like to uh, see that even if I go for some type of physical training, I'm still going to be educated. And for me, in my mind, when I talk with people in government or parents, if I say the word training, what that says to them is there's no brains involved. You just go over it as many times as you can until you can do it. <clears throat> what education means is that it's a combination of all of the things that truly then get to get a behavior that's going to go in the direction. And the last time I checked, for the most part, everything is controlled by this thing called the brain. All right, so we have to have a brain-body connection, a mind-body connection. They all are connected in order for us to be better educated. So we organize education programs. And we support policy development for NGOs as well as government. And sometimes we even have some influence on sport, international sport federations. So uh, what can you uh, do as an XP member? Well, uh, we truly believe that uh, enhancing your international network would be fabulous because as soon as you come into the XP family, you have a higher level platform for which to first of all be visible, second of all to be able to speak uh, with authority, and third, to be able to share your story with the professional world. And so we cannot do and be all things to all people, but we can certainly do our part in the large sector of the world. <clears throat> we can promote services and projects, your services and projects. Uh, I have to give Episcopi a lot of credit. They have done some marvelous work on uh, uh, stories and books and texts that have been printed uh, sometimes through Ixby and Routledge and sometimes through other places uh, um, uh, that are promoting women in sport, uh, that Asian women that's coming uh, from an Episcopi perspective. Uh, so XP can be used to assist, perhaps, in getting publications uh, through um, Routledge or other kinds of places. Uh, we clearly can learn from others. I am, I have to tell you, I, I have, I would not be the person I am, let alone the professional I am, if it would not be for me learning from others in the world. Some of my best, best friends professionally and personally are people from other countries. All right, Rosa is a dear friend. Annalisa from uh, South Africa is a dear friend. Margaret from the UK was a dear friend. And I'm hoping that uh, our marvelous Dr. Usha can also become a dear friend, not to limit 
anybody to be a friend, but to also be able to know that uh, as a friend, I can trust them to tell me the truth, even if I don't want to hear it. All right, and to develop solutions through cross-sectional and interdisciplinary partnerships. This one is so important. XP is truly a leading uh, organization in our field for interdisciplinary looks. And uh, what fascinates me the most is that XP, through its interdisciplinary look, really gets a chance to do great things for the entire person. So we don't have only just one study that's doing with the subcellular levels of exercise physiology. We have a study that will look on at whatever is happening to the human, perhaps with a variety of ways in which to look at and answer the questions. So uh, a very holistic approach. So here we go. Uh, we want to connect more with professionals in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, we also want to nurture young professionals by opening doors. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of people that I, when I was at Berry University, through XP, get, had opportunities for young ones in undergraduate and graduate programs to go to conferences, etc., that XP hosted or was partnering with. Um, <clears throat> we can fast track knowledge that's exchanged with professionals. Uh, we're in the process of designing a new flagship XP event. And we would hope that people from India, uh, through your leadership, would want to be a part of uh, designing what's going to happen in that event. Uh, create uh, XP accredited courses so that something like this uh, could have uh, the approval of uh, XP organization or uh, find some type of a certification to be able to provide. And then we can share knowledge and expertise through region specific programs. And uh, India is such a huge uh, opportunity for all of these things to filter up to the international level uh, that uh, we're very excited about it. So if you have more information or need more information, <clears throat> Detlef Dumont, who I believe might be listening, so hello Detlef, um, uh, please be sure uh, to contact him uh, if you have any comments, questions, etc., or you can contact me. Uh, I'm a vice president, but uh, he runs the uh, office and does a very capable job. So perhaps that's uh, something you can have. I also want to invest a little time with you because, um, uh, Sujit, we've got a little time, right? Uh, yes, you could go ahead. Look up. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the link between sport and national development because this is something that uh, has come uh, to the front uh, since uh, we've been talking this week. And uh, then I'd like to end it off with uh, community coaching so that we can try to find some uh, format that's going to be um, usable for India. So, <clears throat> What this means when we talk about this is this national development uh, can be benefited uh, with uh, resolving conflicts and creating cohesiveness in a society. You know, most societies, uh, US included, uh, we see a lot of tribalism, socioeconomic divisions, ethnic issues. Sport has a way, and uh, I'm not sure that anybody has definitively decided what is it about sport that crosses everything and everybody, but it seems as though it's got a potential for them. Uh, it helps us also to achieve health standards and participation for enjoyment. All right, and so we would have to look at India 
and how, uh, what types of health standards uh, are being looked for. And it can be possible that through fun, through enjoyment, we can actually improve health. And then uh, strong character and confidence to better position people for the challenges of the 21st century. And I wanna remind you again uh, with the Village of 100 that there are 50 males and 50 females, which means participation, character development, and confidence comes through sport or physical activity. So if we leave half the world behind, we have not positioned ourselves as a nation to be in a better position. So in my humble opinion, uh, sport has to be seen from the point of view of national strategic development in terms of human resources and development. Okay, and uh, the other morning, um, I, I really just adored your minister. Uh, not that I don't adore the rest of the panel, but, but the minister, uh, I really think in his soul, he gets it. And uh, I think you guys have a wonderful opportunity to be able to uh, really make some, uh, some uh, long-term change. Uh, because uh, I know Sujit was talking the other day about um, uh, paradigm shifting in the community. And so uh, that's, that's very important. Um, you can find additional wonderful information on uh, sportanddevelopment.org uh, for a variety of things. And if I recall correctly, uh, there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of information uh, on India. And there is no reason why you cannot get a really good international public forum through that website. So take a look. So if we're looking at health standards, how are things like type 2 diabetes, environmental pollution, are the skies gray or are the skies blue when they're supposed to be? Uh, how, uh, who in your population has uh, great respiratory issues? Uh, one of the things that we're finding here in this country is people with respiratory conditions and the COVID virus, they do not always continue to live once they get into that intubation period. Uh, because if they've had uh, lung conditions, uh, they are not set up for anything good, nor are they set up for anything good with high blood pressure. So uh, what do those figures look like uh, that you could use to build cases for improving uh, the role of sports on health standards? Uh, some of the other things that uh, involve are social amenities. And I say social only because these are places where all people or many people could come to. So uh, how many areas do you have uh, where people can come socially? And it could be just an open, open area, could be just cement, could be just grass, could be just dirt. Uh, doesn't matter. There are ways to find social amenities. And uh, part of the uh, piece that comes with the, social, with the health standards is we cannot continue to rely on strongholds in sport, like sports uh, that are designated only through the government. We have to strive to diversify the provision and development of sports. And that comes at the community level uh, for many things when we talk about sport for all. And to reap the benefits of sport, we have to strive to be able to uh, do those types of things. All right, uh, we talked a little bit before about sport and nation building. Well, this is Kluka's viewpoint. So other than religion, if again we believe in any type of religion, because if you remember the village of 100, did not had a fair amount of people who don't really believe the only environment that people can change 
uh, and come together uh, for a positive goal seems to be sport. So it might even be possible through the IOC and the International Sports Federations to help promote world peace and be successful where the UN sometimes has failed. Woo, that's a thought. And we want to deliberate plans to promote and develop sports on a wide scale, uh, which is where the sport for all the community coaches, et cetera, really play a vital role. So uh, this has not, however, been the case. And this whole concept is really kind of uh, talking about sport and development. Uh, it's marginalized by many nations. And here's the piece that I think is terribly important for all of us to remember. Lots of times we, and uh, Vimal and I were, were speaking about this the other day. Uh, sometimes governments, not necessarily India, but you might want to check yourselves. Sometimes uh, the governments uh, put in departments that combine many things all together, like youth, culture, health, uh, uh, physical culture, and you know something else. So uh, it get, they get lumped under one umbrella, and the way that then it's in interpreted is that we don't have to really put our budget or our money where we say we need to because there's so many things attached together. So what some countries have done is they've taken the, the under education, they've placed physical education and under sport, they've had a new ministry or a new department that's absolutely designated for sport, which for them means things that are outside of the school environment. And so there are many different ways to do this, but the key is for you to uh, just reflect on how is the budgeting according to the mission goals and objectives of what you're doing. In other words, we would say in our country, you need to be able to put your money where your mouth is. All right, and the role of, na uh, of sport in national development efforts that is still through everybody across the world is not very well articulated and understood. So you have to take that mission, that vision, those goals, those objectives, and repeat, repeat, repeat. And those who are initially spreading that, you will get very tired of whatever. But in social psychology literature, they are claiming that in order to get someone to hear and then listen and then internalize whatever the mission or the picture is, you have to say it to each person at least nine times. Oh my goodness. Uh, and there are some people in higher education uh, th that I know that say, if the person doesn't get it the first time, forget it. And I go, ooh, no, we have to, we have to repeat and repeat and repeat. So I've, I've got a little example here of the, um, uh, of a sport and development case. Uh, if you want information about this, it's the Mathare Youth Sport Association. This is in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, I was privileged uh, to be old enough and participated enough to see this group start at its beginning 15 years ago. And now it is one of the shining stars for sport and development uh, a marvelous case study on how they were able to identify a program that worked for people in the slums of Nairobi. Okay, and uh, their slogan presently is giving you the sporting chance through sport. And one of the things that they were concerned with at the beginning, by the way, this was started 
by women for girls and women. They were terribly concerned about pregnancy. How are we going to stop young, and I will say young women, because once you get your menses as a woman, and then you are officially a woman, uh, whether uh, uh, chronologically you want to be or not, um, there, is an, there is this issue of uh, what happens when uh, girls, uh, girls and women, young women become pregnant. And uh, they really wanted to fight that because, you know, as soon as someone becomes pregnant, then generally the girl or the young woman has to be responsible for that child. Uh, you know, uh, I always say to the young ones that it's so much fun to make the baby, but it is terribly hard work to keep the baby going for up to 18 years or longer. So uh, all these other pieces called a sustainable program uh, for positive attitudes and hope. One of the things that they have attached to this program is 80 hours a month of garbage cleanup in the slums. Now, the bad news is, oh my goodness, that takes lots and lots of energy because there's lots of garbage cleanup. However, every year that this service is provided, it gets a little easier. Partly because the community has decided, well, maybe I can be helpful with this. And no, I really don't want to live in dirt and filth, right? And this, uh, they adopted a UNESCO goal that Rosa talked about yesterday involving environmental objectives. So how can we take that uh, UNESCO's uh, goals and all of the other goals that India has in terms of all of the things that are meaningful in people's lives. How can we take parts of that and incorporate that into a program that's going to be very specific? Um, this, in, uh, this is an NGO, the Strome Foundation, uh, that uh, is coming from Norway that have, has helped them uh, to initiate this. I want you to also, when you look at this thing on the website, uh, the different kinds over the past 15 years that they've had on people who are definitely um, making uh, a difference and has, some of them have, uh, corporations have come to them <clears throat> because they've heard about this program and are terribly interested in it. All right, let's take a look at universities in sport in the development of a nation. Uh, every nation, including India, uh, are faced with economic and environmental issues. There is no doubt about it because we are really all one world. Uh, it's been proven uh, that a molecule that is in um, California in the U.S. also is of air is shared with uh, those who uh, have volcanic in Indonesia because they've tracked, they've been able to track molecules. So eventually we breathe uh, similar air. So uh, we are all really one in that. Uh, the Olympic movement, perhaps through its solidarity program, can offer financial assistance and material assistance to channel universities offer union uh, physical education. I don't know if you've uh, had a look at that or not, uh, but there could be a way to write the proposals or the grant, grant proposals, etc., to perhaps make that part of, of the human experience uh, because they're looking for uh, ways in which to combine physical education, uh, community sport, and sport development, if you will, um, uh, to push the agenda of the Olympic movement, which has to do with what we believe in as well. So it, it could be that the universities can impact social and economic development by doing applied research. And I, I want to add that 
word applied research, not basic research, but applied re research, so that we have information about human development that includes sport. And that sport then, and physical activity and health, if you will, becomes part of the overall message that makes a difference in social and economic development of your country, but also of the world. All right, so uh, sport and community, nation building. Uh, I love this guy. Uh, I never had an opportunity to meet him, uh, but uh, I have invested a lot of my time in uh, South Africa, and I uh, totaled it up the other, uh, just the other day, and in a 15-year period of time, all the time that I've invested in South Africa has come to about four years of my life. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very appreciative of that. And uh, I did visit Nelson Mandela's uh, home uh, in Cape Town uh, when I was there. Uh, and I used to teach at a, a university that was a historically black institution in our country called Grambling State University. And uh, I was never more surprised. I opened the door and the first thing I saw was a huge quilt that said, Grambling State University thanks Nelson Mandela. And they had this on display in his home. So he says, sport has the power to change the world. It has the power to inspire. It has the power to unite people in a way that little else does. It speaks to youth, especially, in a language they all can understand. Sport can create hope where once there was only despair. It is more powerful than government in breaking down racial barriers. Nothing for South Africa could have been more meaningful and at the right time than for him as the president to put on what used to be referred to as more of a white type sport, for him to embrace the Rugby World Cup and the fact that they won. All right, so there are some suggestions um, sport development needs to be an integral part of national economic strategic planning. And uh, on the opening day, uh, one of the questions that uh, uh, I wanted to raise with the minister was, is this a part of the national economic strategic plan? Because if it is not, then you need to maybe think about what would happen if it did become that? And uh, we all, everybody, has to articulate and define uh, policies to incorporate sport in national development strategies. Okay? India can uh, ensure provision and equity of distribution of resources, especially among poor communities. A great way to do it through sport and physical activity, physical education. Uh, this physical education piece, however, uh, may have to be done a little bit differently only because it's not yet in India a, um, a countable subject, but small detail, that can be taken care of. Um, it might be beneficial when uh, looking at community development to find inexpensive sports uh, that can be used. And so the Mathari project, they took on sport, uh, they took on uh, soccer, football, because they asked the community, what sport do you want to play? All right? So asking the people rather than rolling some things out might be uh, the best way to go for uh, possible success. And it might be possible that the IOC invests in sport development, including research in sports science. So I want to also finish off here by talking about community coaching, because I know this was a question that uh, I think maybe Vimal and Sujit and Dr. Usha and Dr. Kishore uh, um, brought up the other day. 
uh, obviously, coaches, in, in my humble opinion, are uh, specialized teachers because they usually have an area of sports skill that they want to be involved with. Uh, but then the host of all of this is, is there a way not to only make a section or a division or something for community coaching, but also to talk about quality coaching? Because if the person is well uh, versed and competent, it's going to help with participation satisfaction by someone being happily involved in whatever the sporting experiences is in the community, it is also fully possible that some of them will want to have better performance development. And so here comes another piece for building the nation. So there are uh, community coach coaching uh, concepts that are out all over the world uh, that are recognized by uh, the International Council for Coaching Excellence, ICCE, and our current president of ICSPE uh, is Dr. Yuri Schaefer. And uh, Yuri has been a former president or is a past president of ICCE. So he is very well versed in um, the, the kinds of things that happen with coaching education. Uh, the IOC also recognizes the importance of community coaching as do other governing bodies. And so what's probably needed in most places is a coach development system that can improve coaches to deliver the quality sport programs. Here in my experience is what happens. People get all excited about providing programs, projects, and initiatives for people. Okay, so all the money goes into developing uh, teams or uh, groups of, uh, for people. However, the people who are responsible for delivery of those programs, they don't know what they're doing and it's not their fault. So in my opinion, personally, it is critical that if you wish to develop programs for people, you need to be sure that you're developing those who administer and produce and implement the programs in order to have success. It's just like physical education, and it's no fault of the primary school teacher, uh, but he or she has no real knowledge of this kind of a special area. And so when you just throw them in front, what do they usually do? They say, okay, let's have recess or just play. And we know that it's so much more than that. So uh, these are three categories that, uh, for the most part, community coaching uh, has evolved to date. You have a volunteer coach, and uh, it is a parent who has a child participating in sport. All right, so let's say, um, uh, well, let's take uh, hockey. All right. I actually played and coached hockey, can you believe it? Only for girls. <laughs> um, so that parent is a volunteer and the parent wants to do it because the child wants to play hockey. Okay. But the parent may know nothing about hockey, but they're going to volunteer and they will be enthusiastic about it. Second category is community committed coach. This could be a a former player or a parent who has continued to coach after the child has finished. So let's say we got in there to begin with, and now we're, uh, my, my daughter or, or son has graduated from this uh, little program, and uh, I want to continue doing that, but I don't have any vested interest with my child. I just have a passion to volunteer and to do this. And then the third one is also volunteer, and it has to do with perhaps a teenager or who's playing a sport, or the university undergraduate student who may also be playing the sport and wants to get experience in community coaching. Uh, 
So the way in which you want to uh, recruit people for those three areas might be a little bit different, but essentially they are all part of the group that can be potential volunteer coaches. Uh, the significance about volunteering is you must be able to find people who are passionate and dedicated about providing opportunities in the community for children and or people. We could do this same thing with people with disabilities, same thing with people who are older. So some of the components you want to consider has to do with uh, continuing education in sports science and sports specific disciplines. Universities, here you come. What a great opportunity. And maybe they can get university credit for some type of thing that they're taking online um, at, at the least, but at the most, they will also then reinvest into the community. Uh, if you have experienced coaches around India, which I'm sure you do, perhaps they will uh, be part of a mentoring system for those of you who are not uh, as experienced because nothing replaces being able to talk with someone and tell them what your issues are so that they then can provide some assistance. Um, also, perhaps something like an accreditation system might be in the future where you certify coaches according to benchmarks in sports science and sport disciplines. And here's another opportunity for you to connect with the um, national sport federations as well as the international sport federations. Let me mention one thing about uh, accreditation of coaches. If the only package that you can provide is one that is going to be sport specific, usually coming from a governing body of sport, please be sure, either go to the universities and demand it or beg for it or something, but there needs to be a section for more of the generic coaching principles in sports psychology, sports medicines, uh, in terms of injury prevention and all of those things that are common to coaching even for community coaches, because without that piece, then all sorts of mistakes will be made in the specifics, including how to organize a practice, how to teach a practice, how to have, uh, have athletes as learners learn whatever it is, because if they don't learn, they certainly can't be trained. Okay, uh, here are some other pieces. Uh, that are interesting coaching uh, responsibilities are such that um, coaches can ensure a safe and enjoyable environment. That's number one. If the environment is not safe, whether it's school or whether it's just walking down the street, that is not going to uh, be conducive for whatever it is. So that's got to be number one. Whoops. Um, facilitate training and evaluate performance. That's what they've got to do. If they're educated in those kinds of things, then they will know, oops, then they will know those types of behaviors. Um, access and opportunity. Uh, please also remember those two words, in Kluka's opinion, go together. You can have opportunity, but if you don't have access, like if I have the program and I can't get the people there, they have no access, therefore the program fails. But if I can have um, access and opportunity, then I have a chance to take a look and develop all these kinds of things through sport. Okay, so here's a summary. Uh, physical education and nation building, uh, take a look at Rosa's uh, comments and uh, presentation. Uh, so she did an outstanding job, in my opinion. Uh, I've watched it uh, once since she gave it, and I'll probably watch it a few more times. Uh, Sport for All has at least two paths, uh, after school physical education and sport development outside the school. Universities develop 
uh, a sports science and physical education is degree programs. And, and frankly, there is, it is possible for, for all of that to go with bachelor's, master's, and doctoral programs, fully possible. Uh, with the national governing bodies, uh, there's got to be partnership with schools and community coaching for the sports specific piece. And also, uh, it is a great partnering between uh, sports science in universities and the national governing bodies of sport. And the last piece, uh, national government, uh, they're going to take a look at all of these other things, including uh, sport as part of the national economic plan. That is the genuine hope. All right, so read this statement to yourself out loud. What did you say? All right. Who read it? I wish I could see everybody's hand. Read this. Did it, did it say opportunity is nowhere? Or did it say opportunity is now here? <laughs> at any rate, uh, take a look at that. Uh, try it with some of the people you know, some of the teachers and the coaches and the administrators, and see what you, uh, how they see it. If they can see it as opportunity is now here, that means that you are already one step ahead of uh, the others. And I thank you very, very much. Uh, I leave it to uh, my other colleagues to provide the next piece. Uh, is, I guess. Was wonderful. It was a wonderful experience. And uh, could we have three questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, are you asking? You want me to read out the questions? I thought Sa Sanjay is uh, the first question. Then you could take yeah. a second. Sanjay, sir. Uh, there's one question. Your voice is not audible, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, audible, sir. Can you hear? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, the question is, what type of difference between Indian physical education teacher and abroad? Uh, could you provide me with that one more time, please? What is the difference between Indian physical education teacher and abroad? In teachers in India and outside the country. Yeah. Um, well, let me just say uh, a, a common denominator for the most part is that most of the people in the world are extremely dedicated to, to providing opportunities for learning through physical education and physical activity. Another common denominator is that we all suffer from lack of uh, value uh, as the same as math, science, um, whatever, whatever it happens to be. Uh, the differences could be in their position of professionalization. Uh, sometimes if people are designated as a physical education teacher, but ha have no real education in that area, then it is not possible for them to teach what they don't know. So the people who have gone through professionalized or professional programs in physical education and masters and doctoral programs, they will be more professional in what they're doing. And in a way, they can become more creative because the, uh, this is Kluka's belief, the more formal education you have that can be linked with practical experience, the better you are able to deliver something that's going to be beneficial for those you work with. 
I did, you know, I, obviously I must enjoy education because I I've got two doctorates, whoopee, but, but I got them because I wanted to know more about the areas to be more helpful to those I work with, I live with, I, uh, you know, I mentor, or I w do whatever it is, uh, but it also may help for other disciplines to understand that ours is truly an applied discipline. And so we have to be smart about many, many things. I hope that sort of answers the question. So just, are you asking? So just, are you asking the next question? Yeah. Uh, so there's a question by Sora, which is how can we integrate science with a few fields of sports like psychology, traits, and motivation? So that's a very simple question that uh, is there something that you want to do okay uh, the question again was how can how can we integrate science with few fields of uh, sports so I, I believe uh, something to do with sports science people uh, in india are a bit this thing in terms of what does sports science actually mean and how do you integrate science science and sports well, and, uh, uh, and uh, there are elements that they have pointed out in terms of psychology, traits, and motivation, some aspects of sports science. Uh, uh, Pedro and I have actually had this discussion about how would we create a master of science in sports science that would be international. Um, I, I think at the moment it could be possible, and uh, ICSB might actually be a, uh, an opening uh, for this conversation and decision. Um, all of us uh, who have gone through education have taken courses in economics, in, in uh, physiology, and all of these um, already established basic sciences. What sometimes has to happen is we go to uh, uh, psychology if we don't know much about things and we say, is there a way that we can offer a short course or something in uh, either call it psychology of sport or sport psychology and offer it in terms of perhaps a certificate program at first to have sports science. So you would look for all of the sports sciences uh, disciplines that would fit into that. Uh, my suggestion, since you're doing online, is that it may be possible to put something together with those who already have doctorates across the world in the sports science area. Example, Pedro is economics, Rosa is a, a pedagogy and sport management. Uh, there are others in XP who have exercise physiology, etc. cetera. Uh, but they, but um, if you bring those together, what that does is to help bring all of the sciences with the focus on physical activity, sport, and not so much health other than using health uh, through physical activity. So know. that may be possible to do that. That's just one idea. Uh, so one, I, one of the, could one I ask the, a question? Could yeah, yeah. Uh, one, yeah of the top, uh, one of the questions is, by uh, Saint Tinang Sang Long Kumar. One of the problems in the area of sports in India is that many of the states may not have a sports policy. How important it is to have a policy to further motivate and encourage people to take up sports as a lifestyle or career? Is it necessary to look at sport as an industry? Yeah, that, that's a, that's a multi-pronged question. Um, I, I think you first of all have to ask uh, you, or find out. I know that India has a sport policy. All right. So the question, I think you have to look on both sides of it. Where does India's sport policy relate to um, UNESCO goals, all of those kinds of things that are at the international level. How does that fit in? All right, in the meantime then, um, how does the national government see sport 
uh, community sport or um, state sport, how does that fit into the national program uh, for development? Okay, and that may be a different look than what happens with physical education in the schools. I don't know that because I'm not familiar, but you need to ask those, I believe, kinds of questions. From what I know, which is not much, the nation, if you want to build nation, then those policies that are in the states, first of all, there needs to be, but they need to complement whatever happens at the national level. All right, and so um, uh, Detlef is just putting on that quality physical education guidelines for policymakers. Detlef, what was the other piece? Can you, uh, yeah. Uh, at any rate, I can't find it, but um, uh, Detlef will, uh, if you want information about that, it's listed on his suggestions. I just can't uh, quite see where he put it. Uh, oh, here it is. Quality physical education guidelines for policymakers. You can find them on the UNESCO website. Okay, so uh, UNESCO in that regard will be helpful. And um, so you have to do a little bit of uh, visionary homework. Take a look at what is available and going on in the country because you clearly want to support that. You need to look to see how UNESCO and so forth, uh, because if the stuff lines up, not only are you making a difference in the world, but you're also making a difference in the possibility of gaining funding. No guarantee, but if the things line up, then it makes a lot more sense for large groups with uh, a fair amount of money to be able to support programs, projects, initiatives. Thank you. So yeah, you can uh, ask Rosa to sum up. I think Rosa needs to speak up. Rosa? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if she can also take up the question yeah. on quality sum up. P. Yeah. Sum up. Okay, thank you very much, Darlene. It was an excellent presentation. I enjoyed it a lot. And I think you can watch it several times in order to get much more information because there's so much in there. And one of the questions there are in the chat, uh, it's when or how they can see the, this video again, the presentation, yesterday and today. So it is important for you to let them know, okay, for the organizers. Now, uh, I know from my yesterday experience that it's very difficult to be reading all the questions. You have many questions and congratulations, Darlene. But there are two which I think it will be good for you to address. People asking why, I mean, they cannot have individual membership to ICSPE. And there is another one that indicates uh, if ICSPE can provide some live session on activity. So I think it will be important for you to explain a bit more about that. Yeah, just let me uh, very quickly say that uh, XB is an organization, uh, kind of like an umbrella. Uh, it's an organization of organizations. So if you are in a school district, if you are in a university or college, if you are in a government, if you are... Um, in um, yes, uh, research institutions. The, there are those three categories that we talked about. And here's the reason why it is a council rather than an association. The council has, uh, let's say they have 185 member organizations throughout the world. When we go then to talk to the IOC, which is an organization of organizations, UNESCO, organization of organizations, World Health Organization, organization of organizations, we carry all of the people who are members of XP to the table and to make conversations, negotiations, uh, policy uh, kinds of things. So it puts ICSPE on a level where uh, we will have, we hope, the greatest impact uh, and uh, the largest number of 
uh, people represented. I, I think if we translated that 185 to the actual number of people, oh my goodness, we'd be, I would think, uh, Rosa, don't you think tens, tens of thousands, if not more? And so, uh, but when we operate at that international level, it, on policy development and on changing the way the world looks at things, we need to have that kind of a, a stature or a posture. I hope that helps. It's, Rosa, was any I, other questions being asked, Rosa? Yes, I mean, there are many questions, and, and, and I know, and I have to say, because yesterday I wasn't able to watch the non to answer the O, and, and I'm quite sure if later you address Darlene, she could also reply, because that's what I did yesterday. So uh, there's a question in here about how university can collaborate with XP. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the first thing to do, obviously, is you need to become a member so that you become part of the XP family. Um, there are opportunities for uh, your uh, institution to uh, partner on uh, research projects, um, it, it, other initiatives that uh, come to that. Um, there are opportunities for you to be even involved in a thing called the Development Committee. Uh, this is where all the programs, projects, and initiatives for uh, two, every two years come together uh, so that you can um, be involved in the kinds of projects that are occurring. You may also decide uh, that um, as uh, Rosa and four other uh, organizations did, were, was to take a look at quality physical education as a group. And so you may find some of the other members in ICSB that are in colleges and universities that you want to go together to do something so it gives you an opportunity to link and to do some um, good work with other or uh, other um, people who have the same interests. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Rosa? It was, it was really, indeed so good. I don't think we ever think of stopping it, but since the time is crucial for us, and yeah. we look forward to your association, is Bimal, uh, Bimal Kishore says there, I was just thinking because it was so wonderful. We didn't feel like ending the session because. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yes, but Kishore why, Dr. 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 Shah, you are not asking Dr. Uh, Mr. Isaac Doro to speak? Sure, sure, sure. I'm sorry. Uh, Isaac, Isaac, Isaac Dorn. You go, your audio is off, uh, Isaac. No, no, no. I'm, uh... Isaac, yeah, yeah, yeah. Isaac, yeah, I'm sorry. I thought yeah. you, you went there. Please do. Uh, you could. Oh, best. Uh, first, uh, congratulations. And uh, I'm a great listener. <laughs> it was great. I hope yeah. that uh, tomorrow we'll enjoy also the leadership styles, models, and the physical education for the uh, you know modern methodology. And thank you, and uh, hope to see you tomorrow as well. Very interesting. Thank you, Dr. Kluka, and keep in touch. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed you. Um, Ushaman? Kishosa, ma'am. Yeah. Kishosa. Uh, uh, ma'am, before we turn to Kishosa, just one question which I wanted to ask. A lot of people have been asking me offline. Probably they are uh, not uh, feeling comfortable talking out here. A lot of the people out here are physical education teachers. So they basically want to figure out how can they become part of you and also yeah. get into sports, science and other things. Because they are from a different world, you are from a different world. Maybe how do you match? Uh, how do you get them to this thing. So that is one thing, so that this entire thing becomes a little more relevant. Uh, I think the, uh, the part that's important is, first of all, coming from this um, 
outstanding online work. Is there a way that a, a list of Indian colleges and universities can be developed that says, okay, if you are interested in becoming a physical education teacher, these are the, uh, the universities and uh, the person to contact. Then uh, you can also, uh, uh, if you choose, because um, I've had several students from India at the master's level uh, that come with um, all sorts of backgrounds. Uh, one of them came in IT. And oh my gosh, woo, was that a benefit. Uh, but then he got a master's degree in sport management. And so uh, those kinds of things are also possible. So it's not possible to uh, get a degree in physical education at the master's level um, uh, immediately into physical education because there are some requirements usually. Uh, but for sport management, there are many institutions, uh, Rosa, correct me if I'm wrong, but there are many institutions that can take uh, people into that master's program uh, without having too much of a gap. Um, it's kind of like doing a master's in business administration, MBA. You don't, all, you don't have to have a degree in undergraduate degree in business. So um, I, what, I, what I'm getting a feeling for is that uh, by maybe uh, Dr. Kusar and, and Usha can, can uh, devise some kind of a list, uh, electronic list that will be allow, uh, allow people to investigate uh, what is available in sport um, science and or physical education. And then maybe if some universities have plans to do other things, what I would suggest is if there are plans, then you put your university with your contact and then you say, we are planning to uh, have a master's or have a sports science undergraduate so that people can plan for the future. Uh, and I, I also believe that that will give you some impetus to talk to the government about how to keep this nation building going. Thank you. So Sujit, could I ask uh, Kishore sir to... Yes, yes. Sorry. Kishore sir? Kishore sir? Yeah. Coming uh, up, sir? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kishore. See, uh, I think it was... Uh, it is wonderful uh, to hear from Daniel, um, uh, Professor Daniel Kurukwan, uh, the words of wisdom. It has really uh, enlightened our participants, I'm sure. And the sort of questions uh, just come up is a testimony to that. And you know, even uh, the fact that uh, this much of international organization exists, many of us were not aware that you know, you, from hearing you were uh, 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 only we could make out that international council. For of sports science and physical education exists. Uh, there is uh, also a National Association of Sports and Physical Education is there, Commission for Sports Management and Accreditation. These are all many of the things which were quite uh, unaware to many of us and many of the participants. Actually. So having got the knowledge of this such an international organization existing itself is quite informative and educative. And now, the, as rightly pointed out by many of the participants, is that how do, how do we how do you how do we link uh, with these organizations with your expertise so that this becomes a regular affair and we can uh, disseminate the information which you have in a regular basis. What we got today is something very very uh, you know something which is very uh, much acceptable and very much uh, uh, which is of use and uh, implementable to our people. In fact, you have touched many of the core areas of uh, uh, the physical, the modern physical uh, education and community coaching trends, which have been practiced worldwide. And uh, you have also pointed out this will enable us to have a gap analysis to find out where we lack and what we ought to, what we what we need to do in which old segment, what is required to be done. So uh, I think uh, this is just a beginning, and uh, we will keep on having dialogue. With the support of the ministry, uh, uh, Mr. Vimal Anand, and uh, also uh, our BGM, Mr. Sandeep Prathan, 
and we will try to uh, make it an on ongoing affair so that we can have a constant interaction and our participants also we will keep on but we are having the first phase now for 25 days we will then have the second phase so we will keep on adding on uh, the information adding on the uh, the knowledge level and the content part uh, the structure part in such progressively in such a way that we will uh, the knowledge gap can be filled this is what i could uh, I, I i would like to say and i would once again would like to place on record all our three international experts uh, who had been kind enough that to be with us, us despite all their personal inconveniences and all their uh, i think they have not let us know also what is their problem i know that they might be having definitely many other engagements and personal commitments but they made it to be with us all this uh, time all this space and they have been considerate and uh, uh, very 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 uh, rather uh, uh, helpful to us so i once again thank uh, uh, professor dalin kulpa for the uh, for the kind uh, words of wisdom and all the uh, talk which uh, man has done also to madam rosa uh, uh, professor losa and of stm for for the gracious presence all the you know for, uh, for intervening as and when required and supplementing what was required and also as a as a listener though a listener you know you observe a lot by watching and we are going to hear from him tomorrow uh, uh, mr faisal garu also for your uh, kind presence and, uh, and your talks thank you very much thank you dr usha thank you sanjeev and uh, thank you uh, mr subhi and all good luck all good wishes to most all of you uh, that uh, you know the uh, better time let good time come for the world and we will be withstand this uh, tribulation and come out successfully thank you very much thank you dr kishor sir and uh, i really need to thank dr kluka because we didn't want to stop the <laughs> we wanted to continue to so it was like a story being narrated we felt you know i don't know how to thank you i need to thank dr rosa because it was because of rosa you are here today that's, that's true thank, yeah <laughs> it's all rosa's fault <laughs> i need to thank you so i need to thank you so much and uh, only request please be with us for the coming 25 days just i i know it's difficult and anyway, this particular type of fight is difficult. so we want your best <laughs> because your step on this has made i think it's it's been very good so please be with us and thank you so much i'd like to thank dr rosa and uh, your i like to thank uh, isaac daru because you you are indian right now so thank you so much and look forward to listening to you and i'm sure you have other listeners too and we have a number of uh, uh, international experts who are right now as participants thank you so much from the from the across various countries i'd like to thank dr g kishore uh, all the participants because your participants you had a good number today and is very informative i'd like to thank uh, sujit and uh, dr sanjeev prajapati so thank you one and all and hope to see you tomorrow